Well, brethren, to begin the sermon today, please turn with me to Matthew 22. And we'll read a very famous and well-known verse that Jesus said to his disciples. The verse has only eight words. It's a very short verse, but this verse has a very powerful meaning for all of us. We find this in Matthew 22 and verse 14. Matthew 22 and verse 14. In Matthew 22 and verse 14 we read, For many are called, but few are chosen. You know, brethren, some have historically taught in the past in the churches of God that if a person heard God's truth through a church broadcast or read the truth via a church literature, piece of church literature, or watched a church telecast, or talked with a church member about the truth, that person was being called. And if that person acted on that calling and responded to that calling to the point that he repented, he or she repented, started keeping the Sabbath day and the holy days, started keeping the commandments, and, very importantly, started attending church services, then that person had been chosen by our Heavenly Father for salvation. They became the elect of our Heavenly Father. You know, in today's sermon, though, I would like to show that this belief was indeed an error, and that this belief does not accurately portray the true nature of being called and being chosen by our Heavenly Father. Brethren, in my sermon this afternoon entitled, Who are the elect? Who are the elect? I would like to explore the important and spiritually critical subject of the special group of people, special group of believers who constitute the elect of our Heavenly Father. And we will explore this subject in three points. But first, let's define a very, very important term that is used throughout the New Testament. And unfortunately, I think is very misused today in English. Please turn with me to Acts 20. Acts chapter 20. And we will read where the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Ephesian congregation and he addressed this important term. And we read this in Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20 and verse 28. In Acts 20 and in verse 28, Paul writes, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. You know, as we've explored in previous sermons, the word church in Greek is ekklesia. It's E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, and it's Strong's number 1577. And it means the assembly of called out ones. The called out ones as a whole or a unit. This Greek word is a compound word. It's a compound noun formed from two different words. The first part is ek, ek, and it means out of in Greek. And the second part is the verb kaleo. It's a form of the verb kaleo, K-A-L-E-O. We'll get into this in a moment. And it means to call. So Ecclesia is not an organization. It's not a building or a cathedral or a temple or a place of worship. The church, the Ecclesia, is the group of called out ones from our Heavenly Father. And the word church of God just means the called out ones of the Father. Please turn with me once again to Matthew 22 and verse 14. And we'll read the verse again. Matthew 22, 14, it says, For many are called, but few are chosen. So this verse shows that there are called, that many are called, but few are chosen. But brethren, who are the chosen 
or who are the elect? This question leads to the first point of the sermon. The first point concerning who are the elect is there is a difference between the called out ones and the elect. There is a difference between the called out ones and the elect. Again, let's reread Matthew 22:14 and we'll explore two different important words and their meanings. In Matthew 22 and verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. So in this one verse, we have two very distinct words, called and chosen. And let's explore these two words and their grammatical counterparts. Sorry about that, I forgot my, my props on my desk. The first group of words is for the words called. Okay, and there's there is the Greek verb for to call, which is kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, kaleo. And it's the verb, and it means to call or to invite. It is Strong's number 2564. It's K-A-L-E-O. The Greek adjective for called is klesis, K-L-E-S-I-S. Or, I'm sorry, it's kletos. It's K-L-E-T-O-S, kletos. And it's an adjective, and it means called or invited. And then, and that's Strong's 2822. And it means called, invited, or summoned. The Greek noun for calling is at the bottom here, and it's klesis. K-L-E-S-I-S, klesis. And it's Strong's 28, 21. And it means calling or an invitation or a summons. I did this so you could see the, the way to, to write it down in English here. So you have kaleo, the verb, kletos, the adjective, and klesis, which is the noun. Now, in fact, Matthew 22, 14 in the New International Version and in the International Standard Version is translated as, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Let's explore a few examples of three, these three words as they're used in the Bible. First of all, the verb to call, the verb form. We're already here in Matthew 22. Let's begin reading in verse 1. And we will read many occurrences of the verb kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, meaning to call, to invite, or to summon. So we'll begin in verse 1 of Matthew 22. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read this out of the New International Version. In Matthew 22, in verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited, kaleo, to call or to invite, to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell them who have been invited, kaleo, that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And the king was enraged, and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to the servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited... Kaleo, to invite or to call, did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite Kaleo to the banquet, anyone you find. And then we'll skip to verse 14. For many are invited. Kaleo. In this case, it is Kletos, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But few are chosen. So what we commonly refer to as being called 
in English simply means being invited in Greek. In the King James Version, this Greek verb in these scriptures was translated as being bidden. They were bidden to come. Brethren, being called by Heavenly Father is the same as being invited to have a relationship with Him. That's what the invitation is for. Our calling is our invitation. But what is crucial in our spiritual lives and in our spiritual futures is what do we do with that invitation after we have been invited? The invitation does not assure us of anything except that God our Father has truly invited us to have a relationship with Him. Receiving the invitation does not mean that we automatically will enter His kingdom. The second form is the adjective form, which is called. Please turn with me to Romans 1, and we will read where the Apostle Paul discussed what he, that he was called and that the congregation had indeed been called. And we read this in Romans 1, beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called, which is kletos, K-L-E-T-O-S, is the adjective, called, invited, or summoned, to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he has pro had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the whole spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of, from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you also called, or kletos, called, invited, or summoned of Jesus Christ. He's saying, among whom are you also invited of Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to Romans 8, where we, we will read an occurrence of the usage of the adjective form Kletos, K-L-E-T-O-S, meaning called, invited, or summoned. We will read verse 28 in Romans 8. And this is my, my favorite verse in all the Bible. This is a very uplifting verse to me, and it's, I think it's uplifting when we're in the depths of trials and problems. In Romans 8, 28, Romans Chapter 8 and verse 28, verse we all know. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, or kletos, or kletos, K-L-E-T-O-S, kletos, according to his purpose. Now the actual grammatical construct in the Greek says, to those who are being invited. That's what it, the, the actual construct in Greek means to those who are being invited. So in this verse, the Apostle Paul states that all things work together for good to those who love God our Father, to those who are being invited according to His purpose. And the third form is the noun form of calling. Please turn with me to 2 Peter 1 and verse 10 where we will read an occurrence of the usage of the noun form klesis, K-L-E-S-I-S, -E meaning calling or invitation or summons. This verse is an, an important exhortation by the Apostle Peter and is a very well-known verse in the Bible. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, we read about this klesis or this calling. 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling, klesis, your, your calling, your invitation, your summons, and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. The Apostle Peter is exhorting the brethren 
to be diligent to make their calling, their invitation, sure. The Greek adjective for sure is bebeios, which is B-E-B-A-I-O-S, and it means firm or steadfast, enduring or certain or sure. So Peter is encouraging, encouraging us to cause our Heavenly Father's invitation to endure in our lives, to be steadfast and to be firm to where we will never let that invitation slip away. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 1, and we'll read a very, very familiar verse. Another very familiar verse. This verse is the basis for hymn number 68 in our hymnal. Not many wise men now are called. One of the first hymns that I ever sang in the church back almost 50 years ago. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26. We read, For you see your calling, klesis, K-L-E-S-I-S, brother, not that, how not th that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. So the important aspect of these three words is that they all connote the meaning of being invited. So our calling from our Heavenly Father is an invitation to have a relationship with Him. And as the church are called out ones, we actually are the ones who have been invited out of the world. We are a subset of the world as called out ones because we have been called out of the world to have that relationship with the Father. Now, the second group of words is concerning the chosen. And so this deals with the verb to choose, the adjective chosen, and the noun chosen ones or elect. So we have the first uh, word is the Greek verb to choose, and it's eklegomai. It's E-K-L-E-G-O-M-A-I, eklegomai, and it means to choose or to select. It's Strong's number 1586. It also means to pick out for oneself, to select, to choose, or to elect. The Greek adjective chosen is eklektos, e k l e k T O S eklektos is Strong's number 1588, and it means chosen out of, elected, or selected, or picked. The Greek noun for the chosen ones, or for the elect, is ekloge. It's E K L O G E. Ekloge, and it's Strong's number 1589. They're all right next to each other in Strong's Concordance. And it means choosing out. It means selecting out. It means election. It means selection and or the elect. Now we'll go through examples in, in the Bible of these three. So these Greek words all have the connotation of being selected out of a group or being chosen out of a group, or being picked out of a group. Let's explore a few examples of th these three words as they're used in the Bible. First of all, the verb to choose, eklegomai. The Greek word for to choose is eklegomai, E-K-L-E-G-O-M-A-I. And it means to select out, to pick out for oneself, to choose, to elect, or to select. Please turn with me to Luke 6. And we will read where Jesus chose his, his apostles out of his group of disciples. We read this in Luke 6 and verse 12. Luke chapter 6, and we'll begin in verse 12. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, it, we read, And it came to pass in those days that he, Jesus, went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. 
he prayed all night to his father. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. So he had this big group of disciples. And of them, he chose, eklegomai. He chose out, he picked out, or selected out for himself, twelve whom also he called apostles. So Jesus picked out for himself the twelve men whom he wanted from his disciples, from the group of disciples whom he had called. So out of a group of called out ones that he personally had called, he chose and selected or picked out of that group, 12 of them to be apostles. Please turn with me to John 13. Jesus again states that he had chosen the 12 and that he had known whom he had chosen. They were all for a specific purpose. John 13 and verse 18. On the last night of his physical life, talking to his the, the special 12, John 13 and verse 18, he says, I speak not of all, I know whom I have chosen, eklegomai, to select out or pick. He knew whom he had picked. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. So here again, we have a group of men having been chosen out of another group of men. This is an important point. They were specifically and personally selected by Jesus out of a greater number of men. The second form is the adjective form, which is chosen. The Greek adjective chosen is eklektos, E-K-L-E-T-O-S, and it's Strong's number 1588. Again, chosen out or selected or picked out. This adjective is the Greek form used for chosen in Matthew twenty two fourteen. Many are called, but few are chosen or selected or picked out. Please turn with me to Matthew 24, and we'll read three very famous verses that we all know. We've all rehearsed for years, and each, the, each of these verses contains this Greek adjective. The first is Matthew 24 and verse 22. In Matthew 24 and verse 22. In Matthew 24 and verse 22, we read the words of Jesus where he said, And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake... Elect there is eklektos, the selected ones. For their sake, for the ones who have been picked out, they, those days shall be shortened. Now, in Greek, just as in Spanish and in French and many other languages, an adjective can be made into a noun form simply by placing the word the in that language in front of the adjective. Such is the case here in verse 22 in Greek. In English, we have to say the elected ones. It's a little bit more cumbersome in, in, in English. We have to say the, the elected ones, the, the selected ones, the chosen ones, or the ones who are chosen or selected. is just very, very cumbersome in, in English. So in English, uh, many times the, the term is simplified down to the elect which was the case in the King James, for the elect's sake. But in Greek, it's the selected or the picked out ones. Now, let's skip down to verse 24. In Matthew 24 and verse 24, we read, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect, that's eklektos, the selected one. It's the adjective form with the word the in front of it. The picked out ones, the selected ones, or the elect. So Jesus is saying that if it were possible, even the very elected ones or chosen ones 
or the picked out ones should be, would be deceived. And then for the third verse, let's skip down to verse 31. Matthew 24 and verse 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, eklektos, the chosen ones, the ones that have been picked out from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So Jesus tells us in verse 31 that the, the ones who are resurrected at the coming of Jesus are the selected one, the chosen ones, the ones that have been picked out of a bigger group. The word here is not the called out ones. It's the picked out ones of the called out ones. And the third form is the noun form, which is chosen ones. The chosen ones. The Greek noun for the chosen ones or for the elect is ekloge. It's E-K-L-O-G-E. Ekloge in its strong 1589, meaning the choosing out of, the selection of, the election of, or again, the elect. Please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, where the Apostle Paul discusses this selection by our Heavenly Father. 1 Thessalonians 1, and we'll begin in verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election. That's ekloge. That's the selection or the choosing out or the picking out of, of God. That's hotheos. That's the God, that's God our Father. So brethren, our selection is by God our Father. Our calling is by God our Father, and our selection is by God our Father. Please turn with me to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11, and we will read the story of Elijah as summarized by the Apostle Paul concerning the selection of grace. Romans 11 and verse 1. Romans chapter 11 and verse 1. Paul writes in Romans 11 and verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he made intersection, intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, and dig down your altars, and I am left alone. I'm all alone, and they seek my life. But what was the answer of, the, of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election, the ekloge, the selection, the picking out, the choosing out of grace. Brethren, Elijah thought he was the only faithful man left. And you know, he was wrong. There were others according to the Father's selection or grace choosing or picking out of grace so many times in the past we have believed we have believed that to be selected by God our Father we had to be part of this group or that group or this organization or that organization the story of Elijah shows that there are others that God our Father has selected that we may not even know about please turn with me back again to 2 Peter 1 2 Peter chapter 1, where we will reread where the Apostle Paul gives an exhortation and a warning to all the brethren 
including to us today. 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, we read this earlier. 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, Peter writes, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election at cloge, E-K-L-O-G-E, the picking out of, the choosing, the election or selection to make it sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. The Apostle Peter shows that the calling and the election or the selection or the picking out of are different. Again, brethren, the calling or invitation by our Heavenly Father and the selection by our Heavenly Father are two very different and separate actions. In summary, the, the one selected by our Heavenly Father to be in His kingdom is a subset is a subset of the called out ones whom he has invited to have a deep relationship with him. All the ones selected by our Heavenly Father are part of the called out ones who received the invitation. But not all called out ones who receive that invitation will be part of the selected ones. Which leads us to the second point of today's sermon. The second point concerning who are the elect is the parables are a warning to the called out ones. Point number two is that the parables are a warning to the called out ones. Brethren, when Jesus spoke his parables to the people, the subject of the parables were not about people in the world. They weren't about the world. The characters in the parables were not people in the world. The subject of the parables were about the called out ones of our Heavenly Father. And the characters of the parables were our Heavenly Father, Jesus the Anointed One, and the called out ones. And in many of his parables, many of the called out ones do not enter our Heavenly Father's kingdom and do not receive eternal life. Please turn with me to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25, and we'll read a very well-known parable of Jesus. We'll read a few. This parable is clearly about the called out ones of our, of our Heavenly Father. It's not about the world. We be, we'll read this beginning in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 25. So in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1, Jesus tells this parable of the virgins. In Matthew 25 verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and for you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him into the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. You know, brother, the virgins in this parable were not the people in the world waiting for the bridegroom. The virgins were called out ones waiting for Jesus to return. These called out ones were invited by our Heavenly Father to have a relationship with Him. 
all ten virgins had been invited to the wedding. They had their invitation, or else they wouldn't be waiting for the bridegroom. In his parable, Jesus said that all the virgins were asleep, and half the virgins were not ready when the bridegroom or Jesus arrived. The very scary part of the parable is that the Lord said to the five foolish virgins, I do not know you. So in this parable, there will be called out ones who are told by God our Father and by Jesus that they don't know him, that they don't know you. Let's continue further in Matthew 25. And we'll read a parable that Jesus gave concerning the three men and the talents or money that were given to them to, by their master to work with. In Matthew 25 and verse 14, Jesus gives another parable. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five talents. And likewise he who had received two, he also gained another two. And he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought in another five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of your Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of your Lord. Then he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you are a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, there you have what is yours. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I don't sowed, where I have not sowed, and gather where I have not strawed. You ought therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, or put it in a bank. And then at my coming, I should have at least received mine own with usury or with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him who has ten talents. For unto everyone who, who has shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him who has not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast you the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, brethren, again, this parable is not talking about people in the world. The three men in this parable were called out ones of the Father, who had the responsibility of, res of developing a close relationship with our Heavenly Father and with Jesus, and to produce the fruit of the Spirit that our God our Father demands and expects from us. In this parable, the first two men returned 100% increase to their master, to the original investment that was given to them by their master. And they put forth effort. They worked hard and they produced fruit. However, the third man did nothing, did absolutely nothing. He coasted. He didn't even put the money in the bank to, to draw interest. He put forth no effort. There was no growth no increase, and no return on the original investment. The third man was useless to the master because he bore no fruit. That investment, brethren, is the spirit that the Father gives us. Are we increasing that spirit? 
or are we hiding it? Are we just putting it and burying it? And there's no increase when Jesus returns. Again, all three men were called out ones. Yet the third man who did nothing and produced no fruit in his life did not enter our Heavenly Father's kingdom. Rather, he was cast into outer darkness, and he wept and gnashed his teeth. Gnashing means grinding. He grinded his teeth in agony. Please turn with me back to Matthew 22. Well, well, we will read a portion of the parable that we skipped over earlier concerning the people invited to the wedding of the king. In Matthew 22 and verse 10, these are the verses that we skipped over. Matthew 22 and verse 10. We're still talking about the wedding and the invitations and the people invited to the wedding. In Matthew 22 and verse 10, we read, So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man that had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how did you come here in here not having a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the, the famous verse, For many are called kletos, called or invited. Many are invited, but few are kletos, or chosen or picked out. In the time of Jesus, it was traditional for a lord or a king to provide clean wedding garments for all of his wedding guests. If so, the parable is showing that the man most likely refused to put on the very wedding garments that were provided to him, and instead must have just cast them aside, showing just how little respect he had for that king. Brethren, again, this parable is not about the people in the world. Jesus is talking about the called out ones whom he has personally invited to have a relationship with him. As we read earlier in verse 2, the king was preparing a wedding feast for his son. So in this parable, the king is God our Father, who is preparing a wedding feast for his son, Jesus. And God our Father has invited his called out ones to that wedding feast. And he is the one who provides the called out ones with the wedding garments of righteousness that we must be wearing. There was a called out one who was not wearing those wedding garments of righteousness that God our Father had provided. The man had been invited to the wedding. He had his invitation. But because of his lack of respect and his careless attitude toward that invitation, in the end, he was cast in outer darkness. That man was part of the called out ones. But he did not enter into his father's kingdom. And he did not receive eternal life. And the man wept and gnashed his teeth. He grinded his teeth. Please turn with me to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we will read the parable of the sower and the seeds. Matthew chapter 13. And we'll begin in verse 1. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, we read, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and a great multitude were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, which 
where they did not have much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell unto good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Skipping down to verse 18. Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word and anon with joy receives it. Yet has he no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives seed unto the good ground, he is, he is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit, brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Again, brethren, this parable is about the invitation to people from our Heavenly Father and what the invited ones or called out ones do with that invitation. Some simply refuse the invitation. Some accept the invitation, but very quickly turn away. Some accept the invitation and continue in fellowship with our Heavenly Father and Jesus and other called out ones. But in the end, they produce no fruit because of their lack of commitment to our Heavenly Father. And then some accept the invitation and deepen their relationship with the Father and produce much fruit, abundant fruit. These are the selected ones of our Heavenly Father. Brethren, so many of the parables that Jesus spoke to His disciples were not about the people in the world. Instead, they were warnings that Jesus gave in code. Other people would not understand this. The people in the world wouldn't understand it. But it was given to them, his disciples, for them to understand. He gave these warnings in code to the called out ones for them not to be lackadaisical and not to be nonchalant in their approach to their invitation to have a deep relationship with their Heavenly Father. And all that comes with that. Brethren, the third point concerning who are the elect is the called out ones must be producing good fruit in order to be part of the elect. Point number three is the called out ones must be producing good fruit in order to be part of the elect. Please turn with me to Revelation 2. Revelation chapter 2. You know, as we explored in my last sermon, only the portion of the called out ones who are overcoming will be given eternal life. And we read this in Revelation 2 and verse 7, part of the message to the church at Ephesus. Revelation 2 and verse 7. The Apostle John wrote, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, to him who overcomes, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes. This promise and warning to the called out ones is repeated again and again in Revelation 2 verse 11. Revelation 2, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 26, chapter 3, and verse 5, chapter 3, and verse 12, and chap chapter 3, and verse 21. Brethren, the members of the ecclesia in all seven churches were called out ones. They were there because they had been invited and they acted on that invitation. 
but only the called out ones who are overcoming and are producing fruit will be the selected one in our, of our Heavenly Father to whom he will give eternal life and will grant passage and entry into his kingdom. Please turn with me to 1 John 4 where the Apostle John discusses the brethren who had overcome the pulls and the enticements of this world. In 1 John 4 and verse 4, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. In 1 John 4 and verse 4, we read, John writes, You are of God, little children, and, and, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. Brethren, as we explored in my last sermon, the Apostle John is saying that the elect are those who are of the heaven, our Heavenly Father, who follow the Father, who have a relationship with Him, have overcome the world, their inner wickedness, and our adversary, the devil. These elect have utilized the Father's Spirit in their lives, and they have produced fruit. Brethren, there is a point, unfortunately, where God our Father will reject us if we do not overcome and do not bear the fruit of the Spirit that our Heavenly Father is expecting and is demanding. Please turn with me to Luke 13. Luke chapter 13, and we will read a dire warning, a very dire warning given to us in a parable that Jesus gave to his disciples. Our Heavenly Father is patient with us. He's so very patient with us. And he gives us lots of rope, and he gives us lots of latitude to see what we will do and to see where our hearts truly are. He earnestly wants us to succeed and enter his kingdom. He does. He loves us very much. Again, he's the constant in our relationship. We determine our relationship with him. Even though we are the called out ones and have received the invitation to have a relationship with the, our Heavenly Father, if we're not being fruitful, if we're not bearing fruit, if we are neglecting His Spirit, if we're putting anything and everything in front of our Father, if we are continually sinning against Him without truly a desire to repent, there is a point where God our Father will see that we will not change and we will not turn to Him and be fruitful using His Spirit the way He earnestly wants us to be. And we read about this point of no return in Luke 13. Luke chapter 13, and we'll begin in verse 6. Luke chapter 13 and verse 6. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 6, we read, Jesus also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why does it even come, come, encumber the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it, be, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that you shall cut it down. The owner of the fig tree in this parable, brethren, is God our Father. The dresser of the fig tree is Jesus, the anointed one. The point of the parable is that there is a time limit. There is a time limit that our Heavenly Father places on working with us after His invitation to us before He is certain that we will not follow Him, that we will not truly be committed to Him, and that we will not take His invitation seriously, and that we will not replace our will with His will in our lives. We don't know what time limit it, that time limit is. We have no idea. 
in our spiritual lives. We don't know what that time frame is. The important point is that we should never, ever try to find out. Please turn with me to John 15. John chapter 15. Where Jesus talked about the requirement for all of us to bear fruit. We have to bear fruit. Jesus said these words to his disciples on the last night of his physical life. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. John chapter 15 and verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch." and is withered, and the men gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. That's how we glorify our Father. We bear His fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Brethren, Jesus is not talking about the world. He is talking about the called out ones who have received the invitation from our Heavenly Father. If we as called out ones do not bear fruit, if we do not bear fruit, God our Father will not select us to enter into His kingdom. But instead, He will take us away and will ultimately cast us into the lake of fire. Please turn with me again to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. And we will read the ending of the parable, again of the parable of the sower and the seeds. Matthew 13 and verse 23. Matthew 13 and verse 23. But he that receives seed unto the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. This last category, they bore fruit. Again, brethren, there is only one category of those four categories in that parable where there is fruit produced. And it was produced abundantly. And that one category of those four, and those called out ones, there's one category of the four that represents the elect, the eclectos, the selected ones of our Heavenly Father. Because they were the only ones who produced fruit. None of the other categories produced fruit. But brethren, what fruit are we expected to bear abundantly? Please turn with me to Galatians 5. You know where we're, where we're going. Galatians 5, and we'll read two very familiar but crucial and important verses. Galatians 5 and verse 22, and I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. Galatians 5 and verse 22. Galatians 5 and verse 22, Paul writes, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Brethren, how much love do we show to each other each day in the way that we treat one another? How much joy do we spread around each day to others? How much patience do we exhibit? 
and bear for others each day? How much kindness do we show to one another each day? How much goodness and righteousness do we show in our everyday actions? How much faithfulness do we show to our Heavenly Father and to Jesus each day and to th living their way of life? How much gentleness do we show to others in the way that we treat them? How much self-control do we have in curbing our own inner wicked desires each day? Now, brethren, do these two verses reflect our actions, our thoughts, our words, and our attitudes each day? Is this the fruit that we are bearing? Are we bearing this fruit that we must bear? Where are we in bearing this abundant good fruit? Brethren, we must be producing the spiritual fruit that our Heavenly Father expects and truly demands in order for us to be part of His kingdom and to be part of the elect who will enter His kingdom. Brethren, in today's sermon we have explored the subject of who are the elect of our Heavenly Father through three points. Point number one, there is a difference between the called out ones and the elect. You know, brethren, we're not called and invited to be part of a church. We're not called and invited to be part of an organization. We are called out of the world into a relationship with our Heavenly Father and with His Son, Jesus. That's what the invitation is for. But being invited to have a relationship with them does not automatically mean that we will be selected by them to be in our Heavenly Father's kingdom. That is up to us by our own actions and by the own fruit that we are producing. Brethren, where are, what are we doing with this great, incredible invitation that our Heavenly Father has given and presented to us? Point number two, the parables are a warning to the called out ones. No, brethren, the grand majority of Jesus' parables were not about the world. They just weren't about the people in the world. These parables were about the called out ones who received the invitation to have a relationship with, the, with our Heavenly Father. And were warnings. They were actually warnings to those who did, do not take the calling and the invitation of our Heavenly Father seriously. And do not commit to overcoming and bearing good fruit. They're actually warnings to us. Brethren, are we taking this incredible invitation by our Heavenly Father seriously? Or are we lackadaisical in our approach to it? Is our relationship with Him the highest priority in our lives every single day? And point number three, the called out ones must be producing fruit in order to be part of the elect. Brethren, in order to be selected by our Heavenly Father to be in His kingdom, we must be overcoming in our spiritual lives now, and we must be bearing good, abundant fruit in our spiritual lives now. Brethren, are we overcoming, and are we producing and bearing good fruit abundantly? Brethren, for a final verse, please turn with me to Revelation 17. You know, at the end of the age, after the resurrection of the righteous as eternal spiritual sons of our, of our Heavenly Father, the newly resurrected beings will be with Jesus. But who are these newly resurrected beings? And we read about them in Revelation 17 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. In Revelation 17... And in verse 14 we read, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that who are with Him are called kletos, K-A-L-E-T-O-S. They've been invited or called out and chosen 
eklektos, E-K-L-E-K-T-O-S, chosen out or elected or selected or picked out, and faithful. Now the Greek word for faithful in verse 14 is pistos, is P-I-S-T-O-S. It's Strong's number 4103, and it means trustworthy, faithful, reliable, loyal, and is the adjective form of the Greek noun for faithfulness, which we just read in Galatians 5.22 as being a fruit of our Heavenly Father's Holy Spirit. So they are called, they're in, they've been invited, they've been picked out, and they have been faithful and loyal to the Father. So we must be invited by our Heavenly Father, and we must be producing fruit to be selected by our Heavenly Father for entering into His kingdom. And we must be loyal to Him in the way that we live our lives each day and dedicate our lives each day to His will. Brethren, how can our Heavenly Father view us as trustworthy, as faithful, reliable, and loyal if we're not obeying Him? If we're constantly going against Him, if we're not overcoming, if we're not utilizing His Spirit, if we're not patterning our lives after the life of Jesus, <clears throat> if we're not producing the fruit of the Spirit that He is expecting, if we're not ever deepening our relationship with God our Father and with His Son, Jesus, if we're not a bearing and producing the abundant good fruit that God our Father demands and expects, how could He ever entrust us with eternity in His kingdom? How can He trust us with eternity if we're not showing Him now that we will obey Him and follow His precepts now and produce the, the fruit that He wants us to produce our spiritual lives, brethren, are not a game. We are in it to win it. We can't be lackadaisical in our approach to our relationship with God our Father and with His Son, Jesus. We can't be lackadaisical in our approach and our commitment to bearing the fruit of His Spirit or in our commitment to show love to our Heavenly Father through obedience, and to show love to our fellow man through kindness each and every day. Brethren, the more that God our Father works with us, and the more that He draws us ever closer to Him, the greater the sacrifice that we're going to have to make in our lives to be part of the elect. And that sacrifice will require that we exercise faith over fear. Brethren, we are not called into a church. We are not called into an organization. We have been invited to have the great honor and privilege of having a relationship with our Heavenly Father, the most glorious and the most powerful being in all the universe. What a gigantic privilege. What an incredible opportunity. But what we do with that invitation is up to us. And what we do with that invitation, brethren, will determine whether or not we are selected, whether we are picked out by our Heavenly Father to be in His wonderful, glorious kingdom. Brethren, will you be part of the elect.